All right. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, welcome to today's talk, Power and Progress on the Prairie. Uh, I'm Fantasia Painter. I'm a doctoral student here in Ethnic Studies and a graduate fellow at the Joseph A. Myers Center for Research on Native American Issues. I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, the Myers Center recognizes that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo Ohlone. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with the university values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and our commitment to hold UC Berkeley more accountable to the needs, to the self-determined needs of American Indian and Indigenous people. So I'd like to encourage everyone to turn their cell phones on silent. I feel like. Uh, I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Native American Studies Program, the Native American Student Development, American Indian Graduate Program, the American Indian Graduate Student Association, the Center for Ethnographic Research, and of course, the Latinx Research Center. I'd also like to announce the Myers Center's next event on Tuesday, November 5th at 4 p.m. here. Uh, we will host Dr. Beth Redbird, an assistant professor of sociology at Northwestern University. And we have some flyers on the way out if you folks are interested. So today, our speaker will go for around 45 minutes, and then we will have a little bit of time, hopefully, for some Q&A. So please hold your questions and comments till the end. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tom Yolsey, professor of ethnic studies here at UC Berkeley. I've known Tom for about five years now, since I came to Berkeley. Uh, he's my dissertation chair, and he's been among my biggest advocates, and so I'm super happy to be introducing him today. Professor Bielsi received his PhD in anthropology from Columbia University. He's been conduct conducting ethnographic and archival research on Rosebud Reservation, in South Dakota, home of the Suchanalu Lakota, for more than 35 years. He is the author of several books, including Deadliest Enemies, Law and Race Relations on and Off Rosebud Reservation, and Organizing the Lakota, the Political Economy of the New Deal on Pine Ridge and Rosebud Reservations. Today's talk is also the title of his most recent book, Power and Progress on the Prairie, which was published by University of Minnesota Press last year. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Tom Yossi. I'll just uh, set my alarm to go off in 40 minutes, so that will give me a uh, five minute um, I want to thank, um, I want to thank the Joseph Meyer Center for inviting me uh, to talk about my book today. Um, and I also really want to thank um, Fantasia Painter for such a nice introduction. Um, I really enjoy working with Fan. She's doing field work in um, Arizona uh, on the border and Native peoples um, right now. Um, so actually, I changed the title a little bit. <laughs> uh, so the, I'm not going to talk about the entire book. I'm going to talk about one little piece that it, it's in one of the chapters. And um, I'm going to uh, call it um, the, the talk today, Governing Rosebud Reservation. Anti-politics, rendering technical and rendering moral. Uh, a little abstract, but <laughs> we'll, uh, I'll explain what, what it's about in, in a few moments. Uh, so, so I'd like to start with um, a very brief overview of the settler colonial situation um, that um, uh, Lakota people, um, uh, where Lakota people find themselves in the present in a, in a settler colonial situation. Uh, Rosebud Reservation is um, right here, or this is the part of Rosebud Reservation that's officially reg not recognized by the Supreme Court as a reservation. Uh, the original reservation included um, all of this area that's outlined, and the, uh, the dark colored um, blotches are pieces of trust land that were 
part of the original reservation uh, that are still owned either by individual Indian people or by the tribe. Uh, but this outlying area, what the federal government calls outlying trust land, um, is not legally part, or it's not officially part of Rosebud Reservation from the Supreme Court's point of view. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, so the loss of uh, three quarters of the reservation, um, or something on the order of about three, um, three quarters of the reservation, is an important part of um, 20th century history. It happened in the 20th century. And um, uh, that history is part of a larger, um, ro the Rosebud history is part of a larger history of the Lakota people and the Great Sioux Nation. Uh, you guys have heard about that, I think, because of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, uh, in Dakota or Lakota, the Great Sioux Nation is also called um, the Ocheti Shakonwin. And um, that's the, the entity that includes all Sioux-speaking people, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, um, who originally signed a treaty with the United States government in 1851 that recognized um, all of this as um, um, Great Sioux Nation territory. Uh, that, that was uh, whittled down in 1868 to um, a reservation, the Great Sioux Reservation, which uh, comprised the western half of what's now South Dakota. Oops. Um, whittled down again in um, um, 1877 when the United States government um, uh, sent in force to let other people to give up the Black Hills. It's very sensitive to my finger here. Uh, and then uh, whittled that again in 1889. Um, and here's Rosebud Reservation right here. Uh, so um, so that, that's the background um, that we'll come back to at the end of the talk. Um, so um, this is um, uh, a um, part of the General Land Office um, survey of the reservation, um, Rosebud Reservation. It was uh, uh, done in 1896, and I wanted to um, show you this because it, at that time, um, the, um, the reservation was still composed of collectively owned land. From the, the, the land of the reservation was held in trust by uh, the Department of the Interior um, for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And um, the, um, the landscape, I don't know if you can see this very well, but there's a little uh, community here that on the map is uh, listed as Hollow Horn Bear Village. Uh, there's another, sorry, another little village here, Trade Dog Village. And um, these are actually um, um, <coughs> a settlements composed, uh, e e these two different, um, communities were settlements composed of uh, Lakota bands that had, um, uh, during the Buffalo days, had uh, hunted together, hunted buffalo, and there were cooperative economic units. Um, and uh, at this point, the um, social organization of the reservation was still uh, in the form of these Lakota bands that were spread out across the reservation, living in these communal communal and collective entities where whatever food came into the community was shared among everybody. Uh, there's actually a Lakota word for that kind of a community. It's called a Kiyoshpae. Um, and you can see by this point, this was uh, sometime in um, the 1890s, this photograph. Uh, they, they were living in um, uh, log houses, but you can see that they um, they, some people still had teepees that they used that, as either an extra house, uh, excuse me, an extra room um, for their log house. Um, and then if they traveled, which they often did on the reservation, they would also um, use teepees or tents. Um, so one of the things that the government did almost immediately, um, and those of you who are in Native American studies know, know this history very, very well, uh, the government wanted to break up those collective entities, not just on Rosebud Reservation, but throughout the um, United States. And the way that they decided to do that was by taking the tribal land, um, breaking it up into what were called allotments. Um, and uh, the allotments varied in size. Many of them across the United States were 160 acres. 
Uh, but in this part of the country, um, uh, on the Great Plains, um, some of the allotments were 320 acres simply because 160 was too small uh, to make a living at um, uh, cattle ranching. And uh, everybody knew that this part of the country was not farming country, it, it was um, cattle country. That had been originally, of course, the home of the buffalo. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, map on the left shows um, the Excuse me, the tribal lands, um, the collective lands gradually being uh, checkerboarded by allotments made to individuals. And um, the photograph on the right is um, uh, a man named uh, Peter uh, Big Turkey, who um, is actually an allotment map up on the wall. And then there's a, um, uh, um, uh, um, I think it's a map of rivers and hills so that he could locate the land that he wanted to pick, um, pick for his allotment. Um, the, um, the, the effect of this um, was um, that is the allotment of Indian lands in uh, Severalty. Sorry, I cut myself off there, but I can read it to you. So allotment had two colonial missions. Um, one of them um, was uh, first um, what we could call the settler colonial imperative, and that was to make former Indian land available for homesteading and purchase by non-Indians. And one of the ways that that worked was that um, after everybody on the reservation was allotted, um, the, the remaining land was opened up to homesteading. That's what happened in um, all of this area here was opened up to homesteading by non, by non Indians, mostly white people, although there was one African-American man who homesteaded um, in this country. Actually went on to become a, a very well-known uh, early African-American uh, filmmaker. Um, and now I can't remember his name. <laughs> uh, and it's not going to come back to me, but if you're interested, you can email me. Um, uh, so what happened is that the reservation very quickly filled up, and again, this was a 20th century event, um, with non-Indian homestead, uh, non homesteaders who entered land that had been declared surplus by the United States government. Um, there was also a process for um, um, Indian allotments in this part of the area, in this part of the reservation. Um, this is a part, remember, that still recognized by the Supreme Court as the reservation. So it, it was never actually open to homesteading, but um, the, um, the Department of the Interior had a procedure for removing what's called the trust status. It's a legal um, protection that Indian land has throughout the United States. Um, removing the trust status from individual allotments when the allottee um, could demonstrate that they were competent, and that was a, a term of art used by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, that they were competent to manage their own affairs. And when that happened, um, the trust status was removed, uh, the land became taxable, um, it also, um, the individual um, allottee would be given what's called a patent fee, which is just a deed, and um, he could sell the land, mortgage the land, um, and would have to pay taxes in the land. And the vast majority of this land that had been fee patented um, was lost by Indian people, and in many cases because they didn't pay the taxes on it, and the land became um, uh, tax delinquent and was sold by the county. Uh, also, in many cases, um, Indian people, once they got a fee patent or the trust status was removed, would um, go and get a, um, a loan from the bank, from the local bank, uh, and uh, mortgaging the land, and uh, when they uh, defaulted on the loan payments, the land would be taken by the bank. Uh, so in this map, the dark areas are uh, the remaining trust land. I think this was this map is from uh, 2007, something like that. And the white areas represent um, um, well, it's actually kind of um, iconic. It's land owned by white people. <laughs> who um, uh, don't consider themselves to be living on the reservation. Uh, and uh, so if you look at, this is again the original reservation. I don't have the figure, the, um, I don't have the figure in my head, but the, 
majority of the population here, we're talking about something on the, effect, uh, on the order of 60-70% of the population is non-Indians. And um, for, um, uh, for most practical purposes, they um, have no dealings with the tribal government. Uh, they may have personal relationships with Indian people or business relationships with Indian people. Uh, but they have, um, as much as possible, they have nothing to do with the tribe. Um, and um, um, again, I cut this off, I apologize. Um, there was a second colonial um, mission um, in the allotment program. The first one was to get the land out of the hands of Indians. Uh, the second colonial mission was to uh, quote unquote civilize Indian people. It was a formal policy. Um, and um, what the government meant by that, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in particular, uh, was to uh, shape how um, um, individuals thought and acted so as to make them self-supporting and eventually self-governing. Um, and the regulations of the Indian Office in 1904, again, it's, um, it's a 20th century thing, it's not the 19th century. Um, the chief duty of the agent, that's the, um, uh, the reservation superintendent, who's an employee of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, is to induce these Indians to labor um, at civilized pursuits. And allotment was meant to move people in that direction. Partly, uh, the theory was that once they had property, they would, because they now have interests as a property owner, they would automatically and naturally um, begin to think of themselves as individuals rather than members of collectives who have uh, private interests that are centered in their private property. Um, and uh, it was also, um, a, a, the goal on the part of the Bureau of Indian Affairs was to um, replace those collective band organizations or any kind of collective activity among Indian people with um, isolated nuclear families uh, that would think in uh, terms of privacy and private property, and they would be located on their farmstead, and um, culturally would sooner or later, um, probably more in the near term than in the future, um, behave just like non-Indian farmers who were their who were their neighbors. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt is actually a famous quote for uh, people in Native American studies. In 1901, he called the allotment policy. A uh, mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass, uh, and uh, let's see, it acts directly on the family and the individual by um, uh, implanting um, self interest. Um, there's lots of discourse from European affairs records from this period about Native American people not being selfish enough or um, being communists in their natural state, and the necessity of um, uh, allotment uh, to um, to civilize that. So I want to introduce this 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 word um, that um, I'm probably overly obsessed with. Um, I know my students think I'm overly obsessed with this word. <laughs> this word governmentality. Um, uh, governmentality is a uh, it's an idea that comes from the French philosopher. And now I know I'm really putting you to sleep. The French philosopher uh, Michel Foucault. And um, he meant by the concept of governmentality a situation where self-appointed governors or improvers, that's a term that's used by a, another scholar, um, colleague of mine who I uh, really admire, Tanya Lee um, calls them improvers, or trustees, which is another term that is used to refer to those who want to protect and help and improve the lives of others. Um, um, and that's an apt term in the case of Native Americans because, as um, I think certainly the, the people from Native American studies in the room know that one of the fundamental constructs in federal Indian law is the idea of the trust responsibility of the federal government toward American Indians, right? That's to protect them. But in this historical moment, um, it was not just to protect them, it was also to improve them or to civilize them, um, which was the, the, the term civilizing Indians was used until uh, the late 1920s. Um, and uh, the idea is that the, that the um, in governmentality, this abstract concept is that the improvers, the governors, or the trustees 
are actively shaping how individuals um, uh, are active, uh, I'm sorry, actively shape how the individuals to be governed think about and act on their own interests and their own selves. So they have to be taught that. They don't know it naturally. And that's the assumption that's made by governors or by trustees or by improvers in this situation. Um, I wonder if I end the show, it might be easier to um, see the, um, and then when I, can I do that? And I, so it doesn't quite cut me off. Um, you guys probably can't see that, can you? No, it's it's How's that? Okay, let me, let me move this up. Um, I don't know, I, I do that in the cl classroom too. I don't know why I cut myself off like that. Um, so I, I want to look at it at, in a specific historical um, moment um, to unpack the idea of governmentality as a way of, of improving Indian people um, by looking just very briefly at the way that um, uh, something called the Omaha Dance uh, on Rosebud Reservation. And it was called that by Lakota people because it was uh, borrowed from the Omaha people who lived um, uh, nearby. And um, uh, the photograph on the left, on the right, uh, I'm sorry, on the left is an Omaha Dance in 1893. Um, and uh, the photograph on the, on the right is a giveaway um, which is, uh, was commonly associated, still is, um, commonly associated with um, uh, the Omaha dance um, during this um, late 1800s, early 1900s period. Um, so the, um, let me try one more time to see if I, I, I can just read you the, um, I can read you the, the text. Did something. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, the first paragraph, I'll, I'll just, um, I can read it to you. Uh, per, per, first paragraph was a missionary uh, writing to um, uh, an Episcopal missionary writing to the Episcopal Bishop of South Dakota in 1913, and he complains that. Um, once a series of these night dances, um, once a series of these night dances began, a large number of people care nothing for work or home duties or any sort, but the scheme uh, to spend their time largely in visiting from district to district. Okay. Worst thing, they roam and they, um, they they expend their food, they waste money, they waste time, um, visiting from vi district to district, sponging on their neighbors for. It had to do with generosity and cooperative, collective um, uh, access to, reciprocal access to food and whatever resources people had. Uh, sponging on their neighbors and hoping for a portion of the proceeds of the giveaway um, with which to replenish their stock. Or perhaps to enable them after a while to cut a great figure in, um, in, in such a giveaway at their home dance house, right? So they're going to these things because they want to eat for nothing, and um, they want to be able to collect enough uh, material so that they can have their own giveaway. And it's really hard to see the photograph is so small. But, um, in the center here are uh, uh, there's bolts of cloth, and um, I can't even make out what the other things are that they're about to give away. The family here is about to give these things away, and then this is all food, which will then. Um, be distributed among the people, and um, this really, <laughs> this kind of um, uh, generosity um, and reciprocal generosity, because one community or one family will do this on one occasion, another family perhaps in another community on another occasion, and it was an important part, uh, important ritual. It was not a, a religious ritual, but. It was a ritualized form of um, creating bonds of solidarity between families, nuclear families, and between dance 
um, which a lot of people say today is kind of a, like a form of Indian um, uh, social security, right? It's the relationship that you have with other people that's been cultivated through reciprocal, reciprocal assistance with each other, sharing food, sharing resources, that means that when you're in need at some point in the future, perhaps your old age or sickness or something like that, you can depend upon other members of the community. Um, so this, the, the ritual part of it, the powwow, was a very important um, um, factor that helped to generate the emotional connection, uh, which people still have today um, uh, on Rosebud and, and in many other um, Native American communities. Uh, then the, um, I think I'm going to uh, skip to the next page. Um, this is just an example of um, um, the way that the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in 1922, he was actually from South Dakota, so he was familiar with um, people there. Uh, and he, um, um, uh, he, uh, he wrote a circular letter or, or a memo to all of the um, BIA superintendents in 1922, and he um, instructed the superintendents or the agents uh, to persistently encourage and emphasize the Indians' attention to those practical, useful, thrifty, and orderly activities that are indispensable to his well-being and that underlie the preservation of his race in the midst of Com uh, complex and highly competitive conditions. The instinct of individual enterprise and the devotion to the prosperity and elevation of the nuclear family, mm -hmm. the family, uh, should in some way be made paramount in, paramount in every Indian household to the exclusion of idleness, waste of time, and frequent gatherings of whatever nature, and neglect of physical resources upon which depend uh, food, clothing, shelter, and uh, the very beginnings of progress, right? Uh, so I'm not going to read the next one, but um, the picture you want to take away is this: um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs clearly understood that its responsibility was to morally improve Indian people because they were not sufficiently wedded to the morality that is necessary for survival in the modern world. Right? Uh, and I'm going to go to, uh, so just to get a sense of the way that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was, uh, not only did they, they have a, a plan uh, for how they were going to um, civilize Indians, uh, they also tried to measure it. And um, so again, you, you can't possibly see what, what's on this, so I'm going to have to read it to you. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a survey that was conducted of women um, uh, in one community on Rosebud in 1907. And I'm just going to read you the, um, um, the criteria on which the women were being measured uh, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So, um, uh, the uh, first one um, right here. Um, yeah, we'll start right here, is a uh, number of years um, in school. The next one is, um, do they wear citizens' clothes, that is, Western clothes, or do they still dress with a shawl and uh, traditional dress? Um, uh, then uh, there's uh, four questions that uh, relate to cleanliness. So um, they're assessed on the cleanli clean cleanliness of their home, the cleanliness of the beds, the cleanliness of the children, and the cleanliness of the women. And then, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the next uh, um, uh, next set of questions is about the house. So um, they are um, assessed on the number of rooms in the house. Um, uh, sorry. Um, I can't read the next one. The number of windows, ventilation, whether it's good poor or I can't read it. Um, the number of occupants in the house. Um, uh, the number of ch uh, then it's a question: Do the children have vermin, which I, I assume means lice? Um, do the uh, does the mother take an interest in the school? Is she progressive? 
Um, does she a member of any church? Does she attend church? Does she, she attend dances? That, that's, a, that's a bad one. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, the number of... Um, um, oh, and then furniture, the number of beds. Um, does she use tables? Uh, does she use... Um, Sorry, my, <clears throat> it's too small for even me to read. Um, does she have a sewing machine? Uh, does she have um, a cupboard, etc.? You get the picture. So it's it's gender specific. Um, it's about um, it's about morality in this sense, right? It's about um, implanting in women a gendered sense of responsibility toward the family, which ultimately um, you can't enforce with the law. The only way that you can bring this kind of change about is by enticing women to do this, showing them the best way forward. Um, but the government is trying to keep a record on um, how well it's doing. Uh, and then, um, I'll just do the same thing with men. Um, again, gender. Um, do they wear citizens' clothes? So same same question is for women. Uh, the um, the number of years that they were at school. Um, are they progressive? Um, is their hair long or short? Um, that was a big deal to the European affairs in the early 20th century. Uh, do they um, patronize the church? Are they a member of the church? Um, do they um, participate in dances, um, the, uh, the traditional dances? Um, are they married legally? Um, do they take an interest in the school? The number of times they visited the school? Um, let's see. Do they read and write? Do they have a working knowledge of English? The number of cattle that they own? Uh, the number of horses that they own? the number of domestic fowls that they own, the number of cows that are milked, uh, the tons of hay harvested, uh, the acres fence, you get the picture. Um, they're measuring how effective they are at convincing Native people to leave those collective camps, move into single family households, and establish a, a farmstead where um, a farm wife and a farm husband, and a, fa a farmer and a farm wife, um, think and act and behave and see themselves in the same way that the non-Indian neighbors do. And it's very difficult to know how effective this was. Um, uh, I think I'm gonna skip some of this stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip some of this stuff, and I, I'm gonna, um, some of the technical stuff. Um, unless you want to hear about Michelle Foucault, and I have a feeling on a warm afternoon like this. <laughs> Very few of you want to hear about Michelle Foucault, so let's stick to the Lakota people. Um, so, um, you know, the, the obvious question that comes up is where does this extremely misplaced um, sense of how to help, and let's take them at their word, that, um, it, Besides the attempt to try to get land out of the hands of Indian people, there there was um, um, a felt sense of benevolence or a felt sense of responsibility on the part of the government. Um, why did it take this form, um, which largely failed? Um, there um, obviously was a lot of um, cultural change among American Indians. Um, uh, during the reservation period. A lot of that just had to do with the fact that the kids learned to speak English. And then uh, very early on, in the late 1920s, um, uh, people started listening to the radio. And uh, by the 1930s, they were, were watching movies. Um, and they were, um, uh, without any kind of government policy, they were drawn into a lot of American popular culture. Uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that their um, traditional beliefs disappear. And a uh, you know, commonly uh, used concept in Native American studies today is the idea of um, uh, biculturalism or, or synthesis of more than one culture. 
happening at the same time. But one thing we know for certain is that the specific ideas that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was trying to inculcate into Indian people um, did not end up working. It caused a lot of misery because along with this moral regulation or this moral governmentality went the idea that traditional Indian ways is part of the government discourse on this went the idea that traditional Indian ways were not civilized, that uh, they were things to be ashamed of. Um, so there was a, a great deal of um, uh, psychic harm done to Native people. Uh, and a lot of Native people today, uh, many people have heard about this outside of Native American studies. Um, uh, there's a, a growing recognition of the amount of abuse and trauma that was experienced in boarding schools. But the, um, a lot of that abuse and trauma was not physical or sexual, um, but was in fact um, the, um, the diminution or the, the, the presenting traditional, uh, presenting the Lakota language, presenting any kind of aspect of uh, traditional life, like collective um, uh, sharing of resources, sharing of food, uh, living in extended families. Uh, those things were shamed. Um, in the boarding schools and shamed uh, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of damage done. Uh, but the, 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 the point that I'd like to, um, to get to, and then I'm going to move for a, um, uh, a conclusion. Um, the point that I wanted to get to is that um, there was a way in which the, the program of civilizing Indians was directly connected to the settler colonial imperative um, of getting land from Native people into the hands of non-Indians. Um, very early on in the 20th century, about the same time that this program of civilizing Indian people was being developed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and people were actually making their living in the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, trying to civilize Indian people, at the same time, um, Lakota people all over the Dakotas were um, beginning to think and plan for lawsuits against the United States to um, uh, get compensation for lands that had been illegally taken by the United States um, or to actually get land returned. Um, and um, uh, so this, uh, going back to this map from Rosebud Reservation, um, Rosebud people today, um, they know very well that it's only this area that's recognized by the Supreme Court as the reservation. Um, but I don't think I ever met anybody from Rosebud Reservation who didn't think that this entire original reservation, including these areas where non-Indian people have been living for decades, um, more than 100 years. Um, this part of the reservation was open to homesteading in 1904, this part in 1907, and this part in 1910, so more than 100 years ago that non-Indians have been there. Uh, but most of the people at Rosebud um, say that that's still, that's still part of the reservation. The fact that the U.S. government doesn't um, recognize it because of a Supreme Court case is something we're going to continue to fight. Um, and um, uh, what the the... The fact that the program of civilizing Indian people was being pursued at the same time that Lakota people were becoming politicized and organized to do something about the land loss suggests that the, there was a function to the idea of civilizing Indian people. Because what civilizing Indian people says is that the welfare of Indian people will be best served if they behave like white people. Um, whereas what the tribe was saying is that the welfare of Indian people will be best served if we are successful in our claim to get land back or to get compensation for the claim. Right? So what the, um, the governmentality um, of civilizing Indian people did was to deflect, was an attempt to deflect the tension from the land claim that was beginning to develop into a, a serious um, enterprise or a serious project among the Lakota people. Um, they challenged that by saying that, you know, 
You shouldn't be worrying about trying to get your land back. That's unrealistic. It's not going to happen. What you should be worrying about is how you're going to feed your family. Right? So it, um, what I'm suggesting is that there was a, there, there was a, a, a function in that idea of civilizing Indian people or an effect in that idea of civilizing Indian people that was meant to undermine um, or offer an alternative to thinking more politically and more critically about settler colonialism. Um, so just bring it up to the present and then um, um, I'll stop. Um, so um, Bureau of Indian Affairs never talked about the land claim. They talked about how people should be civilized. Um, this is um, a map of the Keystone XL pipeline, which is um, uh, it's under construction now, um, but this is the planned route through South Dakota. Uh, so here's Roosevelt Reservation right here. That's uh, the part that still recognizes the reservation by um, the Supreme Court. Um, here's another one of the reservations, uh, another part of the reservation that was opened up to homesteading. Uh, this was part of the original reservation where the pipeline will um, cross into Nebraska. Uh, from the point of view of the Lakota people, or the people of Roosevelt Reservation, that's still the reservation. Um, and um, um, one of the things, it's not something I did, so I'm not, I have no reason to be proud personally, but one of the things about this community that I work with that I'm so proud of is that in uh, 2019, they sued Donald Trump over the Keystone XL pipeline. And um, they did this along with another Indian tribe from Montana. And um, the argument that they make is that the treaties that were signed um, between the Great Sioux Nation and the United States government in 1851 and in 1868, um, where they put it here, Roosevelt Reservation was created as a permanent homeland in the 1868 treaty. Roosevelt's territory was meant to be their home forever. Its sacred site ceremonial grounds and connection to the territory make it a place, um, it, make it a place it, the tribe, cannot simply leave. Roosevelt is deeply concerned about um, a pipeline crossing its territory without its consent. So I'll just end by saying that um, ever since the late 1890s, Lakota people have had their own idea about what is in the best interests of Lakota people, and that is action on the land claim. And throughout that entire time, non-Indian experts who have worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs or for the Indian Health Service, or who today work for the South Dakota Department of Social Services that's trying to, uh, that is implementing um, what used to be called welfare on the reservation, um, none of these agencies talk about the land claim. It's like the elephant in the room. Uh, so um, I'll leave you with the idea that um, what non-Indian people have been trying to do to Native people is mostly about trying to deflect attention from the land claim, which from the point of view of the tribe and the members of the tribe is what really needs to be done in order to um, best serve the interests of Lakota people in the present. And um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. And, uh, thank you. Um, what an amazing talk. Thank you oh, so thank you. much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. We have a little bit of time for questions, if that's okay with you. Sure, Canada. yeah. We have about half an hour. Um, so I will probably let you take your own questions. Yeah. Um, but I just want everyone, I'm like a big believer in the Eve to approach the questions. I won't make us workshop our questions, but I would remind us to keep them brief and constructive. And so <laughs> keep in mind that uh, Professor Rios did an incredible amount of work. And yeah, cool. Well, I'm happy to answer any question, hostile or, or, or <laughs> yes. No, thanks for your great talk. Oh, I have to stay up here. So. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question, but just a couple comments. One is the word assimilate seems to be appropriate for this talk. Assim yeah. Assimilation. Um, also, um, it seems, I, I've worked with Native people all across the country, and it seems like to justify a genocide of millions of Native Americans, they, they were reduced to animals or animal life. Uh, 
and you know, for thousands of years they lived here, and they never heard the water, the air, and the forest the way we have. And so my question really is, who was more civilized? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and also in regards to land claims, the United Nations they made with them. Yeah, yeah. One of their members, Chief Hal Ray Halberd, he uh, he went to Harvard. And uh, then they have a big casino, and they use the money to honor land claims. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the local farmers and stuff, rural people, were going to have to pay rent to them. And they yeah. they had they, they did a big circle around the reservation, all their tractors, protests. Where, where was this? Upstate New York. Oh, okay. Uh, the yeah. Country. And and uh, actually, they, they worked it out, but it was it was pretty crazy. Um. Uh. I actually have a really quick funny story about um, who's more civilized. So I was, um, uh, I had, a, um, I used to teach in Portland, Oregon, and I had a, um, a, a former student who um, is a Modoc from Klamath Reservation in Oregon. And um, I was sitting with him and his cousin who teaches, his cousin teaches um, at San Francisco State. He's also a Modoc. And um, I was telling him about how um, what an unpleasant human being I was in graduate school, and um, uh, how I, um, I I was kind of um, arrogant because not toward Native people, but um, toward people who toward other white people who didn't agree with me politically. And uh, I mean, I wasn't unpleasant to their face, but I I I, I I was kind of a lefty, arrogant lefty, young punk, <laughs> and I was telling him about this, and I and I said, uh, then when I went to do field work on Northwood Reservation in 1985, um, I met people who um, had a completely different um, expectation about how you talk to other people, and. Um, uh, there, there was a, 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 um, a kind of respect for others um, um, among Native people that, um, having come from New York, I, it, I was, I mean, I guess it was like culture shock, right? So anyway, I was explaining to these two guys how going to Rosebud Reservation changed me and made me much more, um, I don't know, much more concerned about people and about trying to be a good person to other people. I'm not patting myself on the back about that. It's, I'm not very good at it, but <laughs> I learned that to, as something that I wanted to try to uh, have as a goal. And then anyway, um, my friend's cousin said, oh, you mean that they civilized you? <laughs> and I hadn't thought about it. I said, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that, yeah, that, that's, how I, that's how I felt. That yeah, also happened with a lot of Peace Corps workers. Yes. They went to yeah. help the other so-called undeveloped community yeah. people, and they got yeah. an education. Yeah. I'll just say one other thing about your question about the genocide. So, um, uh, so one of the complexities in, Ameri in Native American studies is that um, it, if you look at the way that different components of the dominant population or even different agencies of the government have dealt with Native Americans, um, it's difficult to generalize across the board, right? So if you look at, um, of course, um, um, militia, state militias in the, um, the late 19th century or the second half of the 19th century, um, that's really where the genocide is. It's in your face. It's right there. And you, you can see these irregular soldiers, um, you know, basically equivalent of what's now the National Guard who served part-time and would go into the field without um, proper command and they'd be drinking and everything else. And that's, that's when these massacres happened. Um, at the same time, there were these um, people in uh, the Northeast of the United States, they called themselves the Friends of the Indians. And they were really the people who invented this idea of civilizing Native people. And they, um, they had a very different approach, right? And um, so one of the challenges we have in Native American studies is how do we put together the kind of direct genocidal actions of some parts of the settler state 
with this quote-unquote benevolent um, protection of Aborigines, protection of indigenous peoples, uh, um, racist because it had to do with the idea of um, civilizing indigenous people. But still, it was, it was qualitatively different from people that just wanted to see indigenous people dead. So um, that's one of our that, that's one of our um, challenges in Native American studies is how can we explain these different kind of approaches to Native people, different sentiments toward Native people, different different kinds of feelings of responsibility for Native people or not in different parts of the American population. So anyway, I'm rambling. Sherry. Well, first I want to thank you for a really fascinating talk. Oh, thank you, Sherry. Who um, works in the field, I learned a lot about kind of details of how um, state policies were implemented. I've never seen any of these documents, so thank you for that. Oh, sure. Okay, so um, my general question is, um, can you say a little bit more about why governmentality as a project, governmentality as a project failed? And I'm specifically mm -hmm. wondering about um, um, how Lakota people reacted when Someone just showed up in our house with a little scorecard. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, that's a really good question. That, um, the documents don't tell us. Um, it, it's hard to know. Um, uh, there's nobody alive from that period when I when I was doing my research, so there was nobody I could ask about that. Um, but you know the reactions were um, first of all this thing about the dancing, um, the and this is not just true of Rose, but I think on any reservation where the government tried to stamp out the dancing, um, that just made Native people want to dance more. Um, it's commonly assumed that um, uh, religious ceremonies like the Sun Dance that had been banned, literally banned by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, were um, actually uh, continued to be performed, but they were done uh, out of the, um, they were done away from um, any kind of authority who might hear it or see it taking place. Um, uh, um, on the other hand, I think that the idea of um, having some cows and some horses and a garden and maybe even raising some corn or some wheat. In fact, it's not that I think, I know. That, that interested a lot of American Indian people, um, a lot of Lakota people. So the idea that, they, um, that they, they, they weren't working hard enough to be farmers because they had not, because they were not taking responsibility is, um, it's just a fundamental misconception of what was going on. Um, they did um, engage in farming, um, but because, in part because the, um, the, the allotments that they had were too small for them to really make a living in ranching, um, nobody put all of their resources into um, trying to be a family farmer. They, this was a time also, um, um, ever since the end of World War I, where, where white family farmers were losing their farms because um, the agricultural economy was changing. So the idea that Indian people were supposed to do things that um, white farmers who even had capital and loans from banks and they were trying to make a go of it and they couldn't, they lost, ended up losing their farms. Um, but the, the problem, of course, was not, I think the, reason, the ultimate reason why the governmentality failed is because it misdiagnosed what the issue was. Um, that's great that people would be self-supporting, but if they don't have a sufficient land base to be self-supporting, then um, you can, um, uh, here's, a, here's a rural, uh, a, a rural um, euphemism, you can talk till the cows come home, uh, to people about taking responsibility, but that that's not the issue. The issue is they um, they just don't have the land to be able to compete in um, in the market economy for cattle. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Yes. I have kind of a related question. You um, you mentioned the the inducements to labor from the superintendent, and so what was 
you know, clearly if you want to make, you know, if you have to pay people to pay taxes, then that's a good way of making sure yeah. they go out to work. And if you give them not enough land to live on, that's another good way to make sure they have to go out to work. But what was the labor market? I mean, were, were people working on other farms? Or? Yeah. So um, the, the um, <clears throat> there was uh, some change through the 20th century um, before World War II, um, but the general picture was one in which um, a Lakota family would make a living by a combination of, um, again, having their garden, having a milk cow, uh, raising some cash crops. Um, they would bring in some cash, um, not enough to live on, but enough maybe to buy things that you can't produce yourself. And then they would also um, engage in um, part-time seasonal migrant work. Um, so a lot of them would go to um, pick beets, sugar beets in Nebraska, or they would um, uh, go to North Dakota and work on uh, wheat farms during uh, harvesting. Uh, so through a combination of um, uh, doing agricultural wage labor and then producing some of their own food, and then of course also hunting and collecting uh, plant food, on that, on wild plant food, they were able to put together um, enough to survive on. Um, so uh, again, it was, it was not that they, um, it's just a crazy idea that it's because they weren't committed enough to labor. They labored um, in order to satisfy their needs, and it had nothing to do with um, a lack of a sense of responsibility about work. So, I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes? Yeah, this was a really great presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was particularly intrigued by this kind of the, the summarizing point at the end about how so many of the agencies continue to reflect attention to where the land base and yeah. land claim. And I was struck by just kind of the, the, the timeline, we're a historical timeline of the land alienation and how yeah. it began as this one size reservation and then it was halved in 1868 and then in 1889 it was whittled again. And yes. Something that I'm quite interested in and in, inspired by um, this article, I'm forgetting the author's name at the moment, but about the history of um, uh, our land grant universities and its yes. connection to native land. And I'm noticing that, you know, you said in 1889 the land was whittled again, and that's when South Dakota State was established. Yes. I'm just wondering if you found in any of your archival research around land and land allocation whether there were any kind of direct ties to these land grants in relation to the founding of South Dakota State. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, in fact, it's so glaring that people probably don't even remark on it, but um, what allowed um, the um, state to, um, let's see, let me know now. I'm not sure about, so South Dakota's, um, uh, the University of South Dakota was established, was the University of Dakota mm -hmm. in um, 1864. So that was actually mm -hmm. before um, the 1868 treaty. So okay, the short answer is I don't know. But, but the, 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 the more apt answer is that I'm sure that there are connections and you know, if you want me to look into that, um, I, I'm happy to do that. And, um, and the, land, the data on the land, did that come from the general land sort of office? Is that what you were looking Yes, to? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so most of the, um, um, the general land office has records on individual allotments. Mm -hmm. um, as well as homesteads for non-Indians, so you, you can look them up. Uh, and you know, you could do some kind of quantitative um, study of that. I, I've, I've never done that, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, this it's it's all available online. Mm -hmm. But again, if, um, I, I'm so intrigued by your question about the land grant colleges, and I'm sure there's a connection. I just because of the the, the dates, I'm not sure about what the connection is. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, 
th there's no question that some of the land at the University of South Dakota sold to endow itself was land that had been ceded by the Great Sioux Nation in one of these treaties. Mm -hmm. And that had that not taken place, there wouldn't be a state of South Dakota and there wouldn't be a University of South Dakota. I know that for sure. I just don't know the details. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I, oh, 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 yes. No, um, one thing that always impressed me is how they look seven generations ahead, most all the time, yeah. in, in, in their decision making regarding the communities. That was so far ahead of what we're doing. <laughs> yes, it is. It's actually in the Rosebud Sioux Tribal Constitution, they call it the Seventh Generation um, Amendment, um, which uh, requires that the tribal government. Uh, consider its actions, the effects of its actions on seven generations into the future. So a lot of tribes have, uh, have adopted a seventh generation in their constitution. And I think that was originally, um, um, that woman, she ran on, uh, as vice president uh, on the Green Party. She's from, she's um, Ojibwe. Duke. Hmm? Winona Duke. Duke. I think that, that was part of her uh, platform in the Green Party was the U.S. needs a seventh generation coming into its constitution. To, to myself and a lot of Native American activists, we consider that point that uh, would, would make them a lot more civilized than us. It certainly, it certainly does. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I really, uh, I appreciate it.